Okay, so what have you got here today? Well, this is a, a wonderful way of giving evidence for something that for years and years and years as a teacher, I always had to ask my pupils to kind of take my word for it. And because they were nice, trusting people, they did. But I still wasn't quite happy about it. When you're doing basic ideas of energy with maybe uh, 11, 12 year olds, that sort of thing, um, you might take the idea of having a pen on a desk and saying, right, I lift that up, what sort of energy do I give it? And if they, they've got their lists of forms of energy and they're happy with them, they'll probably say gravitational potential, and that's fine. And then you say, well, when I drop this, the gravitational potential energy goes down, and to get them into the idea of conservation of energy, you say, well, that, that energy cannot just disappear, it has to become something, so it's transferred or transformed, or whatever word you like, into kinetic energy, hence why it gets faster. But then you've got the problem of what happens when it hits the desk, and immediately you can say that, well, there's some sound, and that's fine, but then that sound energy doesn't last very long, so then um, either you as a teacher or the pupils will then start to say, well, where does that energy go next? And then, and this is where you have to ask them usually to take your word for it. You have to say, well, that just ends up making the particles in the room vibrate a little bit faster, so it makes the room warmer. And most pupils tend to be happy taking people's word for that, but it should lodge some questions in the back of the mind, shouldn't it? This idea that, that makes things warmer. Really? Really? I mean, even with an infrared camera, one of the things you might try doing if you get an infrared camera as a teacher is try to film something like that and see if you can actually spot any heat. And unless your infrared camera is very, very good or you're dropping something very, very heavy, you're not gonna notice anything. So it starts to become quite difficult to get some evidence for it, which is where an enormous pair of steel ball bearings. So where do you get those from? Where uh, do you buy there those? There are a number of websites that can do them. They're, they're, they're easily available. You don't need to be, uh, uh, they don't seem to be terribly bothered about who they sell to. Uh, these are 50 millimetres uh, hardened steel ball bearings. Goodness only knows what sort of uh, bearings they're used in, turbines or something like that, I should imagine. Um, and uh, they're just an identical pair, 50 millimetres in diameter. And these are, last time I checked, I think of the region of about 20 or 30 pounds okay. each. So they're not massively cheap, but if you look after them, they'll last absolutely forever. Now, when you smack these together, and the reason why this only really works with ball bearings is that ball bearings, of course, for their usual job, are machined to be incredibly, in fact, if I put it there over the paper pad, machined to be really nicely spherical to the point where their area of contact when you touch them is very, very small, and that's crucial. So when you take these ball bearings and hit them together nice and hard, just like the pen hitting the desk, you've got the obvious sound, but then you've also got the uh, heat being created by, uh, being transferred into heat from the kinetic energy, you've got that happening in a very, very small area, which means that it's quite concentrated. So much so that if you get a piece of paper, and what I would do with a class is I'd get them to, uh, I'd explain this, I'd get them to do a bit of writing about it in the books, and then I'd get them to hold up that exact piece of paper from their books and go around the entire class smacking the ball bearings together with the piece of paper in between the two. And what you get is a hole in the paper. Now, at first, the cynics in your class might be thinking, oh yeah, but you, you've just knocked a hole in the paper, piece of paper. It's like a tear, it's like a rip. That's not really heat burning a hole in the piece of paper, which is in fact what it is. Um, and you can say, well, possibly, the one thing that won't come across on the video until we get smell of vision is that if you do that and then get them to immediately sniff it, they will be able to smell yeah, it, it characteristic smell of burning paper. It, it does smell slightly burnt, actually. You can sort of definitely, definitely kind of notice that. If you're that. really lucky, if you're really lucky, I think it might almost have happened on the second one, actually. If you're really lucky and look really closely, sometimes you do even get at the very slightest amount of brown scorching um, on the paper. I think but we can just about see that on here, it, yeah. It, it tends to be about maybe 1 in 10, 1 in 20, so I wouldn't go around uh, uh, encouraging my pupils to, uh, to look for that. But if it happens, it's a nice bonus to convince them that it is actually burnt. So you are definitely burning a hole in the piece of paper. You're not ripping it, you're not tearing it. And again, this is going to work for the different ways of teaching about energy. So we're taking like the thermal store from the um, potential store to the kinetic store to the thermal store, or, you know, uh, I guess that the older way, which is still taught at A-level at times, is about, you know, kinetic energy and it's heat thermal. energy. Absolutely, so, yeah, yeah it, it works both ways around. But never again should you need to ask the, uh, pupils to take your word for it that that does actually make the pen and the desk and the air hotter. You've got some decent evidence that it does. <laughs>